In 2013, I worked as a baker at a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It was a super old building and had a reputation for being haunted among staff. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. So I spent a week or so inquiring about fellow co-workers, about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4am, unable to turn the lights to work until the 5am barista arrived. Other stories include things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience and felt energetically open to invite something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks, a tall portable shelving unit that was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle managed to get on top of the tarp. I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled and so were my co-workers. However, I wasn't convinced it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and told everyone about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other co-worker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal stuff and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter... I bent over to get a trash bag out of a cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words, and it was textural. I've never heard anything like it before. It was like someone was speaking from another dimension, almost staticky. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio, because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my co-worker behind me, but after finding no other explanation, I turned around and faced her and said, What was that noise? My co-worker looked at me and said, I thought it was you. We both froze in disbelief, and at the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. After a couple seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on top of the espresso bar moving and looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple inches into the air, wiggled a bit side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen and then ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was just so utterly in awe of what had just happened. I remember saying out loud, like, okay, I get it now. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day, it remains the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I've ever witnessed. The other night, I was talking with friends and was reminded of two stories that happened to me involving apparent doubles of people I knew. Probably about 10 years ago, my friends and I were playing a game I made up in a large local cemetery. The game involved one team with flashlights guarding a MacGuffin object. Usually, it was a dim red blinking light I had, like something you'd wear at night jogging or bicycling. The other team would try to sneak past the guards and retrieve the light. Basically, hide and seek meets capture the flag meets flashlight tag. We had just finished a round 
and we were gathering around a large tombstone where the light was sitting when the game ended. We were calling out for the hiding team to come out. The game was over. Most of the seven or eight of us playing were there. We were just waiting on Dan. I was looking around and spotted him in a silhouette in the near distance. The cemetery is on a hill, and the backside of it is mostly set against a steep drop-off, with one of the paths running along the edge. This night was pretty bright, with moonlight and light pollution from the town, so it was pretty easy to pick out, out against the sky as he walked down the path. Oh, there's Dad, I said to the group, pointing. Right after I said that, Dan came walking up from my right. I was so taken aback at a sudden appearance. It took me a second to look back up where I saw the person walking. Obviously, the figure was now gone. This admittedly may not be a paranormal experience, but a creepy encounter with a person. But here's a few reasons it may well be paranormal. I was completely sure it was Dan. When you're good friends with someone, you can recognise their gait and posture as they walk. This, combined with the figure's body type and hair matching Dan perfectly, made me totally sure I'd spotted him. The other reason I don't think it was a person is that they would have had to walk back the way they came, clearly visible against the sky, or past us, under the cemetery office lights to get out of the cemetery, as they were walking into a back corner. It's possible they just walked off into the woods, but I doubt they could walk down the steep, densely wooded hillside quietly. Our investigation over that part of the cemetery, of course, didn't turn up an explanation. Now for the second story, which I'm confident in claiming is paranormal. I worked at a Sears in my town in 2013 as a warehouse worker. One of my jobs was to stock items in the main warehouse in the back, or any of the smaller stock rooms around the store in different departments. One stockroom in particular always gave me and my buddies the creeps. I was never sure why. It was pretty big, more or less dividing the clothing and soft lines departments from the tools and appliances. The inside of the stockroom was divided in two. One was the storage for the shoe department, with sliding ladders like a library to get to all the shelves. And you could walk through from the shoe's entrance and exit out in the appliances. The other side was sectioned off by a chain link fence with shelving attached, and this part, the children's clothing, only had one door in and out, even though you could see through the fence to the other side. When you walked in this room, the wall was on your right, and to the left was a long line of shelves with some folded clothes and some shirts on hangers. You would have to walk nearly the full length of the room before the shelf ended, and you could turn to the left and access the rest of the stock room. I was by myself unboxing clothes when I heard the door open. I was next to the door, but on the other side of the shelf. I looked up and saw the top of my co-worker Jake's head above the hanging shirts. Since he was one of my friends that thought this room was creepy, I tiptoed quietly next to him on the other side of the shelves as he walked down the corridor. When he was almost at the end of the shelf, I jumped forward and yelled, and there was nothing in front of me. Although I was very positive I'd seen Jake's head above the clothes as we both walked to the end of the aisle, he wasn't in the room with me. I'm getting so wigged out just remembering to the corner to empty space. After a few seconds, the doors opened, for real this time, and Jake actually walked in. He asked if I was alright because he heard me yelling, me trying to scare him. And now I looked pale and freaked out. I lied to my manager and said I'd finished stocking the clothes, so I didn't have to be in there the rest of my shift. I later found out from the assistant store manager, Irene, that she had once found a man who had a heart attack and died in the hallway to the restrooms. This hallway, of course, was where the door to the creepy stockroom was. When she was the manager of the shoe department, whose stockroom is adjacent to the creepy one, she came in only one morning when the store was extending its hours for the holidays. It was still dark out before they opened and she was sitting by herself about to eat a quick breakfast. 
she heard one of the sliding ladders squeak, and when she turned to see who it was, two or three of the ladders were sliding back and forth down the shelves, all on their own. We were a joint family. My parents, younger sister, paternal uncle and aunt. Four children, two girls and two boys. My cousins were older than my sister and me. We had an age gap of over eight to ten years. My father and uncle were pretty close, so we stayed together in a building where the ground floor belonged to us and the first floor belonged to my uncle. My aunt and my mom were just cordial. However, my aunt loved us and my mom was very affectionate to her children too. One day my cousin, let's call her Sue, came home from college and started acting very strange. Sue did not do the usual stuff, like washing her face or eating something. Instead, she went straight into the bedroom and slept the entire day. Since my aunt and uncle were full-time working parents, my cousins would mostly stay at our place until my aunt came back from work. My mum was pregnant with my third sister during that time, and she was probably in her third trimester. My aunt came back and called Sue upstairs, but she refused to go for some bizarre reason. My mom, being her usual self, just put it off as some strain, and Sue stayed with us the entire night. Things started right away. I was about 14 or 15 years old, so I remember everything distinctly. My younger sister was about four then. I woke up to the washroom, and as a child, I was always afraid of the dark. I woke my dad up and he stood outside the bathroom. Now Sue, Mom, and my younger sister were in one bedroom, and my dad and I were sleeping in another one, so we didn't know what was happening in the other bedroom. My dad just felt something was not right and checked on them, and to his fright, both Sue and younger sister was missing. He woke my mom up, but my mom's state was almost like she was drugged to sleep. She could barely open her eyes. My dad started waking everyone up, and everyone started looking for them with my uncle, aunt, and cousins. My uncle found Sue and my younger sister crying profusely at the terrace. Sue was standing on the edge of the fence wall, and my younger sister was standing, looking at her, crying irrefutably. They were brought down, and my aunt, uncle, and dad immediately understood that something was not right. While all this was happening, my mom woke up and suddenly started screaming from downstairs that Sue was trying to kill her, the baby. Sue was with us. My aunt looked visibly disturbed. She was staring at different points as if she was looking at someone. All the kids were sent downstairs the following day while Sue was up with my dad, uncle and aunt. Since my mum was pregnant, she wasn't allowed to be. My cousins were all grown-ups, but they knew something was wrong because my younger sister had been crying non-stop since last night and nothing could calm her down. They were all trying to get her to sleep, but in vain. She too looked at different points and continued crying. Around noontime, a priest came, and Sue tried all of them and came downstairs, which scared us. She looked at my mom and gave him an evil scowl, and she carried my sister away. She was jumping in weird postures. Everyone stopped her, and then we could see she was possessed. She held abuses in Hebrew, Arabic, and Urdu. She spoke about 12 different voices, which everyone heard. They were voices of women, men, and it still sent chills down my spine to even think of it. They sent us all upstairs again, and meanwhile, my mother started sensing the anxiety of something, and unfortunately, her water broke. She was taken to hospital by my cousins while my uncle, aunt, and dad stayed at home with Sue. To this day, I don't know what happened, because my dad never spoke of it. But we came back from the hospital the next day, and Sue was gone. She wasn't there. Nobody said of her, and the priest did some recitations on all of us. We shifted from that house because of all the negative energy. About two years later, Sue was brought back home. She looked like she'd just bones left, nothing else. She didn't remember anything. My uncle and aunt tried to normalise her life, but in vain. In two or three weeks, her health deteriorated. And she passed away. Except for my uncle, aunt and dad, nobody knows what happened or where she was taken. My uncle and dad both passed away, so the only person who knows now is my aunt, who never speaks of it. 
It's an unspoken rule not to talk or mention those two nightmare days in the house. That night, the priest there died in an accident precisely three days after Sue was taken away from home. That house was sold right after Sue passed away. To this day, I've never experienced something even remotely chilling as this. From the day my younger sister was born, my cousins, me and my sisters never go a day without doing the recitations we were told to do by the priest. It's like routine now for us. Something seriously weird happened just a little while ago that really creeped me out. I don't usually want to see any paranormal stuff, like my mom or my sister, so for me to say that I think it was a ghost is super out of the ordinary. So I let my cat into my porch and closed the door and locked it. I then proceeded to eat my lunch while my mom was vacuuming the bathroom floor. Once I was done, I double checked that the door was closed and went on my way to play some games in my room. About 10 minutes pass and my mom enters my room and starts interrogating me about if I had just come from opening the back door. To which I replied, no, I was on my bed the whole time and I know I locked and closed the door. She then asked my older sister, who replied that she was in her room doing assignments for college the whole time and that it wasn't her. Creeped out, my mom explains that when she finished vacuuming, she heard the door alarm chirp, signalling someone opened the door. And when she went to see which one of us went outside the door, it was a good six inches open and my dog had bolted all the way to my parents' room, away from the living room and hid under the bed. We then checked the back porch cameras and they didn't activate to any movement like it would if I opened the door or somebody was on the porch. We checked all the rooms in the house and nothing. My sister then commented that the door to the garage had opened earlier in the day in the same fashion and that two of the cabinets were wide open, but she didn't think much of it. Needless to say, I'm kind of creeped out now. I know it wasn't my mom because she is very neurotic about locking doors and closing them. So much so sometimes we get locked out by her. In March of 2019, I was admitted to a residential treatment centre. It was a little unique for a treatment centre, I believe, but I'm not sure because I don't have anything to compare it to. The centre was a mansion in the mountains. I think it was a vacation home for a doctor or something before the centre bought it. I was with about 15 other girls there. People were admitted and discharged every once in a while, but the maximum capacity was 16 girls. When I first got there, the girls and the staff told me that there was a ghost named Benjamin. I figured they were just playing a trick on me or something since I was new. I didn't believe in ghosts. I'm still not sure what to believe, but I know there was something in that house. Every day, we would have a journal writing and meditation hour. The staff would put meditation music on the TV and leave the remote on the kitchen counter. There was only one remote. We wrote in our journals and stuff in the living room, which was next to the kitchen and an open floor plan type space. However, no one including the staff was close enough to the remote to be able to touch it without us noticing. Several times while meditation music was playing on YouTube on the TV, the music would stop. It would exit the video, scroll through suggested videos and select something else. The meditation channel was a live channel, so it wasn't because the video just ended. And it wasn't just playing the watch next suggestion, it was literally scrolling through video choices. Most of the time it just chose random videos that were weird, but harmless. I don't remember the specific because again, it was over a year ago. Once though, it selected a video of a girl killing herself. I have no idea why that video was on YouTube. The TV was the first weird thing that I witnessed personally, but I still dismissed it. I figured we had some kind of glitchy remote. The next thing that happened that I saw was during school. We had school in a large bedroom upstairs. The classroom had a doorway, but no door. I was talking to the school counsellor at a table close to the doorway, 
and we heard whistling and footsteps coming up the stairs. One of the therapists at the centre would always whistle as he was coming up the stairs, but he had been gone for a while because his wife had died from cancer. We both jumped up and ran out of the classroom to see if it was him. It would have been strange because his wife had just died that week, but there was no one there. During our school time, there's only one regular staff member that isn't in the classroom. They usually stay in the kitchen though, and pretty much all of the main floor is visible from the balcony upstairs. We asked the staff member who was sitting in the kitchen if she had walked up the stairs just then, but she said she hadn't. Another time, close to bedtime, we were finishing the nightly checkup where we filled out a mood questionnaire thing and shared it with the group. We had finished chores, which included vacuuming the upstairs landing. I had done this chore and specifically remember turning the vacuum cleaner off and moving it to the corner. The upstairs landing is huge and all of us girls and the staff were in the other corner sharing the checkups. The vacuum cleaner turned on and it was in a different place than where I had put it. At night, we aren't allowed to do the checkups until everyone is ready for bed, on the landing, with the doors to the bedrooms closed. The bedroom doors automatically lock when you close them. One of the bedroom doors would get stuck sometimes and girls would occasionally struggle to open it after changing. This was a long term residential place and so some of the higher level girls could be alone in bedrooms unsupervised with the doors closed to change. Anyways, the doorknob was jiggling back and forth and the door was shaking a bit so we figured a girl was stuck. One of the staff unlocked the room but no one was in there. They checked the closet, but there was definitely no one in the bedroom. We'd also hear a little boy's voice in the basement most nights. I think the girls just named him Benjamin themselves, but I'm not really sure. Benjamin pretty much terrorised us though. None of us slept alone, ever. When girls in our bedrooms were out on weekend passes, we would sleep on the landing with the staff. We weren't required to. We were just terrified of being alone in our bedrooms at night. There were security cameras everywhere and the doors to the outside had some kind of high-tech magnetic locks that could only be opened with key cards. Whenever they were opened, a chime would sound. One night, the chime sounded when everyone was upstairs. The staff checked the security cameras to find the door to the garage open and close by itself. Another night, we heard a loud slam downstairs and then a couple more. When the staff checked the cameras, the cupboard doors were slamming by themselves. I've seen this footage, so I know it isn't the staff messing with us. I doubt they would do that anyways. The faucets would turn on, like the knobs would turn, while we were staring directly at them. When we would shower, we would hear knocks at the bathroom door, but no one would be there. The staff are supposed to check on us every 15 minutes, but they would announce themselves by name. They don't just knock on the doors got to the point that none of us were sleeping at night. The staff wouldn't go into the basement by themselves. And when we were getting ready for bed, we would have another girl sit outside the door and talk to us the whole time. Once in the shower, I heard the knock on the door, which eventually we just tried to ignore because it happened so much. Our shower curtains were those cheap semi-see-through ones, where if you put something directly against the curtain, you could see the colour and outline of it. I thought I heard something inside the bathroom, so I poked my head out of the shower, but there was nothing there. I closed the curtain again, and there was a hand on the other side. Like not just a handprint, but like an actual hand touching the outside of the curtain. I yanked the curtain back, but there was still no one there. I just got dressed as fast as I could and went back out to the landing. Other things happened there, but honestly, there were so many things that it would take too long to list them all. I know most of these sound strange more than outright scary, but there was always this feeling in the place when things would happen. I don't really know how to describe it, but it would just make all of us terrified. Some girls would get goosebumps or start sweating. I've never had something so terrifying happen in my life. I lived there for four months. I felt trapped because I couldn't leave and Benjamin seemed to be getting worse every day. The treatment centre was fairly new. I think it had only been open for about a year before I was admitted, but from what I can tell, 
Benjamin had been there the whole time. I don't really know what it was there, but I feel like it was something. Sometimes I'd tell some of what happened to my friends, but I think they don't really believe that a lot of it actually happened. Ever since getting discharged last August, I still get creepy feelings. Nothing has happened since then, so I don't think whatever it was has followed me. But I really haven't been able to make peace with whatever happened in that house. I think a lot of the girls that were there feel the same. I just don't really know where to turn, and tonight is especially hard for some reason. So I guess I might as well try this. I'm mostly just venting. Believe what you will, but I swear it's true. Even if it sounds crazy. If someone has had a similar experience with things they can't explain, any advice on how to feel less terrified and creeped out constantly, I'd be extremely appreciated. I think I just need some advice and support for dealing with it. So when I was growing up, I would spend some of my spring breaks at a cabin in the north, near Capilano. We called the cabin Camp Capilano, and I would go with my local community center. I believe the cabin we went to was in the 1992 movie To Grandmother's House We Go. It was the house the grandmother lived in. Anyways, I stayed at this cabin multiple times with this group of other kids and our leaders. We'd always all slept together in the side of the cabin that had a boy's sign on the door. Never really thought anything of it. But the last year I ever went to that camp, we stayed on the girl's side. I had thought the cabin felt sad and strange to begin with. But for some reason, sleeping on the side we left empty the previous years gave me anxiety. Eventually, it became time for everyone to go to sleep, and I got picked to be in a top bunk. I was pretty happy about it. Until about 3am when I woke up and the room was ice cold. I had a rather slippery old rubber coated mattress and my sleeping bag had decided to slide almost all the way off me while I had been asleep. I sat up to get back inside and as I sat all the way up, I saw a completely white little girl that looked like nothing like the other kids I was with. She was standing over one of the leaders sleeping on the floor, just staring at her. At this time, I'd realised that I was looking at some kind of spirit. I quickly pulled my sleeping bag up and over my head as I lay back down. I knew what I saw wasn't just a dream and it was real. I did the cliche and pinched myself several times to make sure of it. Some time had passed and I was finally warm again. Fully closed inside my sleeping bag, I decided it was time to check the room for the girl. She was gone and so was the cold. I didn't sleep too well after. The next day, I mentioned this to my friends. The leaders quickly caught wind of this and did everything to try and tell me it was a dream. I knew this was so, the other kids wouldn't be scared, but they were scared regardless. It was just before lunch and that meant pool time. The creepy old cabin had a heated outdoor pool right beside it and the groundskeeper and over was the lifeguard. Being the curious kid I am, I floated over to the side he was sitting at and began asking him about anyone seeing ghosts on the property. He didn't hold back, telling me that his daughter had seen a ghost a few times in the cabin and on the trails behind it. I asked him if it was an all-white little girl with long straight hair, and he gave me a weird look preceded by, how did you know that? That's exactly what my daughter said. I told him my experience, and he acted as if it was almost good luck that I saw the girl. I honestly thought it was incredible, but our leaders quickly shut down the conversation after hearing us. I understand there were other kids there, but I had to solve that mystery. Maybe it was because of watching too much Scooby-Doo or other paranormal-based shows as a kid. The same day, the leaders sat us down and tried to tell everyone that I just had a dream, and not to listen to me or the owner of the cabin. I was obviously hurt, especially because they had just told me I was dreaming about it, but I knew what I saw and the feelings it produced in me. I left that camp a few days later with no other paranormal experiences. It left me with so many questions about the cabin. I searched a bit online recently to try and find anything about it at all. 
but all I can find are some pictures of it at a booking website. I decided I'll email them tomorrow with some questions. Probably a new owner by now. If anyone out there hears this and knows about Camp Capilano and stayed there and felt a little weird, please let me know. If I could piece us together even a little more, I'd be very happy. I want to know who that girl was and what happened in that place. There's this small forest close to my friend's house where we always went to walk his dog. We found out a kid had died there years before. We always had a sensation of just another presence being there when we would be there after sunset. So one day, we decided to invite a second friend who had quite some experience himself to come along. So after sunset, the three of us and the dog went to the forest to see if we could contact the entity. Stupid, I know. The second friend spoke some Latin words at the edge of the forest. He said this would help us. The moment we stepped in the forest, I saw a white entity in a tree a couple meters, less than 20, away from us. It gave off a lot of negative energy. So I told my friends about it. They said that they felt it too, and this wasn't the entity we wanted to contact. The second friend friend said this one felt very dangerous. The dog was also nervous and scared at this moment and wanted to run. So we keep on walking away from the presence. I think we pissed it off. After about five minutes, I felt another presence. This one felt friendly. We would hear crunching leaves beside us, but always out of sight. And when we would stop to look it, it stopped as well. One of my friends said he knew this is the one we wanted to try to contact with, but that the entity wanted to play a game. So for the whole walk, we would hear running and crunching leaves behind us, never seeing a thing. The dog never got nervous or scared, so we trusted it. When we get close to the end of the forest, the running and crunching leaves stopped and the presence vanished. But when we were about to walk out of the forest, all of us froze. It actually felt like time stood still or even like another realm. It was very weird. We felt a presence again, a very heavy one. I can remember I couldn't move from the neck down, but when I looked at the exit, there was this tree in the middle of the path. The trunk was split in about 50 centimeters off the ground. So you could see right between the two arms. Through the split, I could see a very clear silhouette of a young girl behind the tree. I could see the face, but it was facing us. At that moment, the dog started to bark. I remember the second friend said something in Latin again, and everything went back to normal. We could move again, and the entity was gone. All of us were freaked out, and didn't understand what had happened. So we immediately went to my friend's house after... I still don't know what we encountered that day, nor do the others. Several years ago, I was living in a house with my mom, dad and dog. I was around 16 or 17 at the time, I think, and my room was upstairs while my parents slept downstairs. I sometimes listen to music or have a YouTube video in the background to help me go to sleep. Sometimes I don't. That particular night, I didn't feel like I needed the extra sound to fall asleep. So I was just laying in silence with the AC buzzing in the background. My bed was pressed into a corner of my room and I was on my side facing the wall. I had only closed my eyes and settled in for a few minutes. So it wasn't one of those half asleep things. I was very much awake. When I heard this deep, guttural, throaty male voice breathed the word pretty into my ear. I froze, my first thought being that someone had broken in and I was about to be assaulted or kidnapped or something. I waited a second before turning my phone on and whirling around, pointing the light in the space behind me. It was empty. My dog, who had fallen asleep in my room earlier in the night, was on the floor, having been woken up from the voice. The light or the sound of my bed creaking from me moving. I'm not sure which. 
and was looking around in confusion, ears perked. I was absolutely terrified, and after checking my room and the rest of the upstairs for signs of a trespasser, I laid back down and turned on a YouTube video to calm me down. I eventually went to sleep, but it wasn't easy. My dog had been asleep, my parents had been asleep downstairs, and no one had broken into our house that night to whisper pretty in my ear and then vanish. To this day, I can still remember almost exactly what that voice sounded like. I'm 99% sure it wasn't a dream, since like I said, I had just settled into sleep and was still awake. I also have no history of auditory hallucinations. First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer, from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That, and the fact that their cats rarely ever went down to the basements, and I'm severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 15 or 16. That night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So, my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened and she knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of saying something. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to there's a man hiding in the bathroom since they'd had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet which had the door closed. She opened the door, and she saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough sound come from what sounded like the entrance of the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, we both started packing up all our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop, and rather than leave the basement, we went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor length mirror in the room, which we used to bar the door. We did all this in complete silence, some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside of the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced there was a living person in the basement with us, since the sounds were so clear, and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up, to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. 
Megan even texted as her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain there was someone in the basement with us. While we knew there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. We were both so scared of making any sort of noise, for a reason neither of us understood, that we made sure to walk on our toes and take steps at the exact same time to minimise the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorised by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around, the rocks at the bottom moving and bouncing off the window. Then it went silent. About ten minutes later, it sounded like another animal fell in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much the entire hour, if I'm remembering correctly. The entire time all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended, or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise, and we heard my uncle get up to take their dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that we had been filled with the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little safe with leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then on a count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point, the basement was fully illuminated in sunlight, and the lights we had left on when we vacated the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen, where her dad was making coffee or something. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement, still not fully convinced it wasn't a normal person. He checked, and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with, and the entire basement was empty. Megan made us some ramen for breakfast, and so we were starving, and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs, eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, but when I told the same story, and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then she experienced it for herself later that year. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense, and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there, and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorised that it was Theodore, the name they gave the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us, or who. I don't know why they were there, or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way I've never, ever felt since. The night I changed my mind about ghosts. I've had a paranormal experience in the past that I've mostly kept to myself and only shared briefly a couple of times with friends. I could never forget what happened that night so I decided, rather than keeping this to myself, I'll share my experience. It was the summer of second grade. I was about seven years old. I played baseball with my cousin. Although this experience was 15 years ago, 
I remember it all so clearly. Almost every weekend, I would stay over at his house so we could go to practice early in the morning. However, every once in a while, our weekend practices would get cancelled because of weather or if our coach just wouldn't be able to make it out to practice. On this night, our practice was cancelled the next morning. My cousins had always told me wild stories about their house being haunted and they being okay with it, although sometimes they get a little freaked out. I never bought into any of their claims because I didn't think anything like this could be real. I stayed up pretty late playing video games with my cousin on his PlayStation. We were playing some base fishing. And at midnight, my cousin had fallen asleep, so I stood up to play more games. I had finally decided to go to sleep at about 1.30am. About an hour or two after I had gone to sleep, I woke up to the sound of my younger cousin, two years old, crying. I decided that I didn't want to deal with it, so I grabbed my pillow and threw it at my cousin. Nathan, your brother's crying in the living room. My cousin's a heavy sleeper, so he didn't budge. I attempted to get his attention one more time by calling out to him from across the room. Still no answer. So after about a minute of this crying, I went out to take him back to his mom. I got out of bed, retrieved my pillow, and walked up the three steps at the door, going into the living room. As soon as I walked through the door frame into the living room, my cousin's crying ceased. It doesn't just quiet down or slowly stop. His crying completely ceased as soon as I stepped through the doorway. This took me back a second. I thought it was weird. Then I continued to look for my cousin. I searched the living room, the hallway, the kitchen and the bathroom, but I couldn't find him. I figured he stopped crying and went back to bed, so I decided to do the same. After laying in bed for ten or so minutes, I couldn't fall asleep. I heard my cousin start crying again, louder than last time. I followed my same routine and tried to get my older cousin's attention, but same as before, he didn't wake up. So I get to check on my younger cousin. I don't even bother to grab my pillow this time. I walked up the three steps and stepped into the living room. As soon as I passed through the door frame, his crying ceased, same as before. At this moment, I started to remember all the things that my cousins would tell me about their house being haunted. I'm a little freaked out now, so this time I could turn on all the lights. I searched everywhere for my younger cousin, but just like the first time, I couldn't find him. I'm frightened, because it doesn't make sense to me what's going on. So I turn off all the lights and walk quickly back to my cousin's room and lay down. I try to go to sleep, but only a few minutes later, I hear the sound of a grown man yelling from down the street. I try to blow this off because my cousin doesn't live too far from a park. That a few homeless people stay at. I figured it's just a man on drugs or something. However, his screaming is constant. The scream is just constant, but it's getting louder, getting closer. Now the sound appears to be only a few houses down, and the yelling feels like it's right outside the window. I covered my hand under my blanket, as if to keep me safe, until the crescendo sounded like it was right next to me, shrieking in my ear. Then it suddenly stops. It doesn't slow down, it just completely stopped. It was just like my cousin's crying. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. I just laid there, shaking under my blanket. The next morning, I told my cousin Nathan about everything that happened that night. After telling him everything that happened, I remember him saying, That's crazy. See, I told you my house is haunted. So we don't normally use my son's bedroom, except for play and clothes. He's two, and he sleeps with us. Two nights ago, I left the door open so he could freely roam in and out. You can see down the hallway to his room from the living room, so this wasn't a big deal safety-wise. He's just quietly playing in his room for a while, and then suddenly sprints out with obvious genuine distress, yelling, Scary, scary, eyes, and pointing to his room. I ask him what's wrong and he just keeps repeating eyes. So I take his hand and ask him to show me. He takes me to his room and points to an empty wall. There's nothing on this wall except a window covered by a curtain. 
who was pointing to the right of the window. I reassured him that he's safe, it's okay, and privately dismissed it as active imagination. About an hour later, he points down the hall again, yelling about eyes. As soon as I move to investigate, he gasps in shock and says, gone? And that was it. Fast forward to today, my baby's sitting for a friend. The daughter in question is 12 and a skeptic, and they're playing in his room. We did not tell her about the eyes. I hear him talk about the eyes again, and she comes out to tell me pretty much the same story I experienced two nights ago. This time I ask him to show me where the eyes are specifically, and he points to the same spot as before. He can't see me as he's in front of me facing away, but the second I looked up to where he was pointing, he gasped and said gone, just like the first time. I've tried asking questions, but I don't think he has the vocabulary yet to really answer them. All I get is that the eyes are there, and they're scary. Five years ago, my sister gave birth to her second child. And because her partner was working shift work as a security guard, I often went over to her house on the nights he worked to give her company and help with the kids. She lives about a 10 minute drive from me, so the routine was usually me going over there around 5 p.m. and leaving to come home around 12 or 1 a.m. On one of these nothing out of the ordinary nights, I left at the usual time and drove home singing to tunes in the car. I didn't feel tired, as I've always been a night owl, and I was just eager to get home and chill out after the stress of rocking a baby to sleep for over an hour. It happened every night with my nephew. The estate I live in has two main entrances that both lead you toward a big roundabout, which I have to turn at to go in the direction of my house. When I approached the roundabout, I could see a small light almost flickering on the street that continued directly ahead on the other side of the roundabout. So basically, straight ahead. I remember saying, what the f is that? And instead of turning left to go in the direction of my house, I made the quick decision to drive straight through and see what it was. The light was moving rapidly in a short space, and within seconds, my car was close enough to see that the source of the light was a torch. The little boy was using to move back and forth in the patch of dirt that he was kneeling on. He looked around four years old. He had neat blonde hair and seemed to just be playing in the dirt, alone, at 1am in the morning. I slowed down the car and stopped in front of him. My window was already down and he was on the same side of the street that the driver's side of my car was on, so we were feet apart. Once I had stopped, the car was still running, but I had my foot on the brake. I was about to ask him what he was doing outside by himself when his head shot up really quickly and he stared directly at me. His eyes were entirely black, no other color in them, and I saw them very, very clearly. I think it took me about three seconds to register what I had seen and kick into flight mode and I sped off. I did tell my friends and family about the experience, but for some reason, it was never something that lingered on my mind. It was almost as though I woke up the next day and just put what I had seen in the back of my mind. With some hindsight now, I think that putting it away in the back of my mind was my way of dealing with witnessing something like that. Almost as though my brain couldn't handle it, if that makes any sense. My family has always been somewhat sensitive to the paranormal. More than a few of us have had unexplained instances, but nothing like what kept happening a few years back. The year was 2000, and while the world survived Y2K, unfortunately, my great-grandmother did not. A few months after her death, every few days, we would receive phone calls from a number caller ID, said was 000 000 000. Every time we picked it up was constant white noise, like a TV channel that didn't come in right. The first few times we simply assumed something was going on with the phone lines and disregarded it. However, for whatever reason, we always picked it up. 
Now, for those of you young ones, the year 2000 was a different time. Cell phones were new, and most people had landlines still. The worst part was the fact that almost all of the internet was dial-up, meaning a simple phone call could interrupt the song you've spent the past five hours downloading on LimeWire. So obviously, these white noise calls became an annoyance very quickly. Finally, my mother called the phone company to see if they could see where it was coming from. Well, once the phone company investigated the number, they discovered the calls were coming from a payphone. But not just any payphone, this payphone happened to be located right outside the cemetery, where we had a short few short months ago laid my granny to rest. Not only that, but the payphone was disconnected from use a couple of years before, and wasn't even capable of making calls. This settles it for my family. We decided it was my granny, so every time the calls came, we simply spoke to her the same way we always had and all was good. The calls continued for around two years at this point. I lived at the time in an area where tornadoes were rare, but when we had one, it tended to be incredibly damaging. One night, one came through the neighborhood, causing a lot of damage. However, my home was thankfully spared. Not long after it passed, the phone rang. This time, however, instead of white noise, my mother swears she hears her ask if everyone is okay. Mom reassures her we're all fine and everything is okay. After that, the calls stop and we hope she's moved on to find her peace, knowing we're okay. Ten years later, both my grandmother and grandfather have passed and been buried alongside the rest of our family. My mom decided to move into her parents' home. At the time, I'm living with a boyfriend and we decided to stop by the cemetery so I could introduce him to my beloved grandparents. Once I got back in the car, I checked Facebook and my mother had only two minutes before posting a photo of a phone showing the same treble zero number and saying how after so many years, she's finally hearing from heaven again. I call her frantic because I'm literally staring at their graves at that very moment. She received the call while my ex and I were standing there. My only assumption to this day was my family really didn't like my boyfriend then and was willing to call beyond the grave to make that fact known. That was the last call we ever received, but not our last experience. To this day, however, we still have the same landline number, just in case they ever need to talk to us again. So I worked at a mortuary for a little while, embalming and crematory and picking up bodies. This story isn't super scary, just very weird. The room we embalmed in was your average white, clean, filled to the brim with chemicals, embalming tools, and three stainless steel prep tables. I spent a lot of time there giving after death care to our descendants, so the scary factor of being surrounded by dead people wasn't really a thing for me at this point. Although, some nights I slept there when I was on call, and it was certainly eerie every time something creaked. Or when I put the lights out and all that was left was a deep red glow from the lit up coke vending machine we had. There was one day though that actually spooked me to the point of asking my co-workers about it. I had begun the usual routine, but something caught my eye. I looked up and noticed a man standing in that bright white room, wearing a black suit and tie, watching me do my work. He was almost translucent, so pale, an old man. Needless to say, I went ahead and exited the room as calmly as I could, and when I told my co-workers about it, they all sort of glanced between each other and smirked. Almost unanimously they said, Oh yes, that's right. We've all seen him. He wears a suit, right? Always stands in the corner of the room. I'm a skeptic for the most part, but events like this make me wonder. It was so normal to see this man, but no one really knew why he hung around the mortuary like that. I wonder if he was ever mistreated after he died. Not every mortuary worker is a stand-up person, and why would a ghost or spirit linger somewhere other than where he or she died? Anyway, we had occasionally seen creepy things in the huge, empty fields surrounding the mortuary as well, but I like to think it was just our minds playing tricks. Knowing where we were and what we did for work probably heightened our nerves enough for us to perceive strange happenings. But I'll always wonder 
who the man in the mortuary was and why he was in the embalming room. When I was a kid, I used to see a tall woman wearing white with black hair enter my little sister's room, followed by a small baby crawling behind her at night time. My sister and I had all sorts of experiences with being suddenly grabbed. I think we all know the difference between a muscle twitch and an actual grab. She never saw the woman, but she did hear a woman constantly tell her, they need me. It was terrifying, and I've always been plagued with horrifyingly vivid, violent and graphic nightmares and night terrors, even to this day. But as an adult, I question the legitimacy of what we experienced as a kid because, well, we have no proof. Fast forward to the present day, I'm 30 and she's 26. She has a baby now. When I was on the phone with her not long ago, she stepped away to get her kid who was crying and I heard a hiss hissing whisper say, stay with me, which gave me the heebie-jeebies, but I joked about hearing a ghost as soon as she left and she froze. She asked me what it said and I told her, to which she replied with, dude, there's a fucking ghost in here. And my husband doesn't believe me, but I hear it all the time. So of course I'm like, that's creepy as heck, but okay. A couple of weeks go by and she recently messaged me saying her son was acting weird the moment she heard something again. And he looked directly into a corner of the room and whined. He's two years old. So it's that baby whining when they don't like something. Today, she sent me videos from her camera monitor. Her son was sleeping and woke up saying, stop it over and over. And then later one was repeating, go away, go away, go away. And wiggling around uncomfortably. I cannot help but be completely and utterly creeped out by this because my sister isn't someone who makes shit up for funsies or fakes videos. So I've lived in the same house for the better part of 25 years now. When I first noticed it, it just seemed that every now and then a shadow would be slightly out of place based on natural lighting. Think elongated or bulged from what the shadow should be. You'd walk in, see a shadow just a hair out of the ordinary. Could be nights, could be the middle of the day. Leave the room and return a few minutes later and the shadow would have recessed back to where it should be based on the lighting. About seven years ago, I saw a pair of solid black legs, standing clear of the wall. Walked past my bedroom door. I was so convinced that someone had to be in the house. I grabbed my pistol, woke everyone up, and checked every inch of the house from top to bottom. Absolutely nothing was out of place. I restate that I've slept in the same room for the better part of 20 years total. I'm well aware of what shadows cast from outside look like. Following this, however, things calmed down for a few years. Now, whatever it is has actively tried to not draw attention to itself, and I don't have any feelings of dread or malice, unless I'm sure it's in one area and I intentionally corner whatever it may be into that area. Recently, it's taken to moving around at near floor level and about the size of our new cat, likely once again attempting to go unnoticed, but it's gotten considerably bolder with its movements several times making me juke and turn on a light because I thought I nearly stepped on my cat, only for the cat to still be asleep on the other side of the house. Now, the random moving shadow isn't all. Not only myself, but everyone in the house regularly thinks we hear the other call our name, or that one of us has music, never distinguishable, but audible enough to hear, coming from somewhere in the house. At one point, I distinctly heard an unknown woman's voice say, I'm right here. And I had to go outside to see if someone was talking loudly in the neighborhood. Big surprise, nobody was outside and no extra cars were around. It reached a point where I went to both an optometrist and a psychologist to make sure my vision was solid and I wasn't losing my mind to stress or anything. Completely clear on both fronts. I've made attempts to photograph or capture on video any proof, but as I said, for whatever reason, it absolutely does not want to be noticed by anyone. I don't have any intention of trying to press it to do anything, nor am I concerned about its presence in the house. I'm just curious, 
to what it could be.